All right, you ready to do it? I'm ready if you are. All right, Jan, here we go. So let me just make sure we're recording, bada bing. All right, so five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. I am very, very, two very excited to have my guest today, Jan Hawken. Jan, welcome. Thank you for having me. All right. So Jan is a pr professor emeritus of psychology at Portland State University, clinical psychologist, author, and documentary filmmaker. Jan has published extensively in the areas of psychoanalysis and feminism, the history of psychiatric diagnosis, the psychology of storytelling, group responses to violence, and the dynamics of social change. From refugee camps, war zones, domestic violence shelters and asylums, to drag bars and hip-hop clubs, her project focuses on people who inhabit the border zones of society and their insights on the broader social order. Wow. I read that and I was like, I mean, first of all, it's, it's a great intro because it's very succinct, but it is just supercharged with um, really a lot of what I hope this podcast is about. Anyway, thanks so much for doing this. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Before we get going here, um, Jan, share with our listeners where you're from originally and where, where you are currently. I, I grew up in Seattle um, and ended up here after graduate school in Portland, Oregon, initially at Oregon Health Sciences University, uh, Department of Psychiatry, and uh, then ha have been at Portland State University uh, for it was on the faculty uh, for 35 years, retired wow. 2011, so I'm emeritus now. I uh, had a clinical practice, um, but also have been since my retirement a visiting professor in a number of universities around the world, focusing on some of the themes you're taking up today, uh, diagnostic dilemmas and um, using the methods of documentary film or visual methods in the social sciences. I've been quite active in that as well, doing a couple films now on the work of, of climate resistance and um, movement lawyers working with climate activists. What are, what's movement lawyers? What are movement lawyers? <laughs> These are attorneys that defend climate activists working on the front lines, many of them using the necessity defense, which is controversial in the law um, where you, um, engage in a form of uh, civil disobedience to disrupt the oil industry. And, um, and the aim is to plead not guilty, go to court, get a jury trial to be able to plead the case of the climate emergency. I see. So this is another area of um, kind of the frontline work that I've been interested in. Um, and of course, now it's upon all of us at, at the on the front lines of a, a climate emergency. Okay. Um, your documentary, one of the documentaries is called Mind Zone, and that follows therapists with the 113th Army Combat Stress Control Detachment. I'm just reading from the um, uh, website here. Uh, as they carry out two conflicting missions, protecting soldiers from battle fatigue and keeping these same soldiers in the fight. Um your book is called Psych Psychiatry, Politics, and PTSD. And we'll have both those links up here at the show notes page at the traumatherapistpodcast.com. Jan, before we get into the, the specifics here, how did you get into this interest, specialization of trauma, PTSD? Um, share that journey with us. Well, my first career was as a psychiatric nurse. And during the 1970s, many of us in psychiatry identified with what was called the anti-psychiatry movement, which was a bit of a misnomer because many of us worked in the field of psychiatrists and included psychiatrists and mental health workers who were critiquing the medical model, the way diagnoses were used in the context of the Vietnam War. There were a lot of veterans involved addressing the issues of trauma related to the war. Women were coming out and, and uh, critiquing the medical model, over-pathologizing women, particularly in marginalized groups. And trauma emerged as a very powerful construct at that time to challenge the medical model. 
to argue that um, much of what had been defined as personality disorder, psych psychotic disorders, or in the area of uh, anxiety disorders were reactions to, um, to um, assaults in the case of the rape survivor movement assaults in the area of war um, um, situations in the con context of warfare. So this was a really powerful movement. And um, at the same time, I began to become critical of the overexpansion and the cost of overuse of the trauma model. And so perhaps we can talk about that as well. But it was a very important movement at the time. Partly it was a movement against the overprescribing as well, because the, the thinking at the time was trauma survivors require more care, more careful listening, because the memory of of traumatic events can be scattered or incoherent. So it called for a more patient, careful mode of listening um, that initially uh, medications were counterindicated. So in the, the context of that movement, I became very um, involved in, um, in um, a number of campaigns that argued for um, an expansion of the concept of trauma, particularly of course around recovered memories <clears throat> of child sexual abuse. But by the late 20th century, the trauma therapy movement had taken a turn that, that worried me. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting avenues we can go down here. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I, I, and I know we could do we could do several episodes on everything you've got going. I just that, covered thirty years. You, you did, yeah. <laughs> okay. But let's talk a little bit about that. What what you're talking about right now? Why did it worry you? Well, alongside my field research and and scholar the you know <clears throat> scholarly line of my um, acad academic work. Um, I also had a clinical practice uh, throughout my career, and um, I was supervising students who also, if, through my position at the university, were assigned to crisis lines and working in crisis facilities, and increasingly in the 90s, there was a focus on um, diagnosing women as uh, suffering from multiple personality disorder, Satanic ritual abuse became um, a, a campaign, a kind of moral campaign to expose the number of children and adults, initially women, who had suffered unspeakable torment at the hands of Satan worshipers, many their parents, their neighbors, their pastors. And so I began to worry about these trauma narratives that initially had been rape survivors and, and survivors of war that now have become increasingly dramatic and, um, and how difficult it was to question the veracity of them. Because the thinking at the time among clinicians in the 80s and 90s was the, you could err in the direction of underdiagnosing trauma, but not overdiagnosing it. So that was the burden the, the social burden we faced was to fail to recognize the horror and scope of the trauma, you know, micro holocausts everywhere. And it, at the same time, what you had going on on the political level in this country was the dismantling of social welfare services, the dismantling of much of the public sector and privatizing the rise of neoliberalism. So I began to pursue this line of analysis that, um, that suffering had to become more and more dramatic to, to, to cross that threshold of indifference. That everyday misery of poor people, of women burdened by two jobs, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, without support for childcare, the everyday mundane misery of people fail to, to cross that threshold, that you had to have a very riveting, dramatic story of trauma to command attention, including in the courts. 
So I know that's a big picture frame that I'm mm. opening up here, but I think part of the what happens with clinicians is that because our job is we see people one at a time and in a private intimate space that's protected understandably and um, importantly, that sometimes that big picture context gets lost. How we're being shaped even in our diagnostic decisions, our, our responsiveness to patients by um, a larger uh, framework that allows or disallows uh, particular forms of suffering to be recognized. So um, that's been a lot of my life work as a clinician and um, a psychologist is to bring that broader context into the picture, how we're all shaped by the kind of the cultural materials we have available to us and so on. So just, just to make sure I have this clear, part of what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the all these horrific examples of trauma that were, were, were coming out more and more becoming clear, they were kind of covering up in a sense or, or blinding the, what you used the word, kind of the day-to-day -day mundane trauma of existence in a sense. And that was getting lost. Clinicians were what were not seeing that, were not recognizing that, that was not shifting the needle as much. Um, yes, that, that, that is an argument. And of course, in a book I published um, over 20 years ago, Pillar of Salt, Gender, Merrill's, Gender Memory and the Perils of Looking Back, and my recent book and other articles I've published along the way, I've kind of tracked that. Um, the, the evidence in support of that or my line of argument and the, the field research um, that I drawn, but I, I think, um, you know, any construct has, um, can be a kind of, or any clinical tool can be a two-edged sword. So the trauma, concept of trauma, the trauma therapy movement, and I call it a movement because it had enormous impact also on the, on popular culture, the expansion of awareness of trauma and the the cultural problem of denial or dismissal or minimizing of suffering. But the, it had this other aspect to it that I felt was um, difficult to acknowledge among clinicians, including our own role as translators and interpreters of what was admittedly often inchoate or incoherent fragments mm -hmm. of a past that we, people were trying to put together individually or in some cases group formats. So I felt a big blind spot among um, our own clinical ranks was in recognizing how we could, without realizing it, shape um, and elicit more and more dramatic accounts, thinking the more dramatic the account, the more we're getting to the palpable, horrifying heart. <laughs> of a problem. And I saw give, many patients. Give me an example. Okay. Um, I saw, um, for example, one patient that comes to mind, I saw her for a number of years and first sought me out in the 90s because I was a no, pretty well-known feminist as well as clinician in my town, in my city in Portland. And she had seen a therapist who had hypnotized her. And um, she came to me feeling uncomfortable with that therapist, but wanting to, but believing that if she could recover, uh, recover a memory of child sexual abuse, it would help make sense of her life and the many troubles she suffered from. And she, she felt she, um, she met criteria on many checklists she read online. She had had some problems with eating, you know, anxiety, you know, a, a lot of that, the clinical symptoms people are associated, uh, were associating with um, child, sexual, child sexual abuse survivors. And she wanted, she trusted me as an academic, but wanted me to help her remember 
something that happened early in her life of which she had no memory. So my approach to her was not to give her a lecture on the, on the unreliability of memory, but to say, well, let's, let's work with what you do remember. And to, um, and this was a young woman had a lot of chaos in her family, um, a lot of neglect. And I said, it's sometimes hard to picture what wasn't there. And maybe you're looking for a, you know, a devil in the closet because it's so hard to picture an empty closet. And so it was a way of acknowledging her search and not dismissing it. And I think that happened a lot with my scientific colleagues, you know, who were very dismissive of this and said, clinicians, you are just, you're creating the thing that you're diagnosing. It's iatrogenic. And I said, but there's, there's something going on here we need to pay attention to. It's not sufficient and it's, um, and it's oppressive to just dismiss faulty memories, but there are ways of working with these situations. And I remember another patient of mine who recalled being um, slashed across his chest by his father as a child. And then it came out later that this was, he had had some surgeries that he felt ashamed of that explained his scars and why it was, it was better to have a story of being slashed by a gang than to be this little sickly kid who had scars from surgery. And so I became interested in what, what therapists also find compelling in this story. Um, I remembered my own first experiencing a therapist as a young woman and realizing this therapist was particularly interested in a story I had of being molested by a, um, you know, when I was babysitting and how I had kind of fought and called the police. It was a valiant story, you know, of fighting them off. But I thought this therapist is particularly interested in this story where I didn't feel that was where my struggle lied as a young woman. So I think that sensitized me to this issue of what, what the third year we talk about clinicians is attuned to. Interesting. You know, it's interesting talking to you because I, I feel like you're, you're putting, um, you're opening a door that few, certainly I've, I haven't had a conversation like this. Uh, it, it feels like a very different conversation where you're really looking at trauma, how therapists view trauma, how society views trauma um, specifically. And yeah, it's, it's very interesting to me. You know, there's another aspect to the, to the work, <clears throat> the clinical work of trauma therapy that I, I'd like to address. And that is the, the question of um, and this was something I became sensitive to as a young activist psychologist was the, um, the, the um, right to a certain amount of authorizing your own diagnosis. So if a therapist says you have um, a histrionic disorder or, or you're suffering from a certain kind of depression, um, that's, that's um, a clinical, um, it, it's a, a clinical authority that therapist has, but I came out of a period where the, the patient also has in a sense authorized that <laughs> and own it and it has to make sense to you um, as you work together and understand the nature of your problems. And I'm very careful about who I identify as a trauma survivor. And in many places in the world where I've worked, particularly in Africa, places of Af in Africa, um, there's a lot of, um, of distress about Western uh, clinicians coming in and labeling whole groups of people, trauma survivors or suffer those suffering from PTSD versus others. And you know, because trauma is also suggests there's some damage that resulted from your suffering. Mm 
And a lot of marginalized groups who have endured tremendous suffering, including Native American, Black, and Latina people, Latinx people, communities I've worked with, they talk about trauma, but they don't self-identify as a group with PTSD or many of the clinical concepts we use because they there is such a burden of being seen as damaged. And I think we cannot assume that people who endure suffering are traumatized in the clinical sense. Isn't it, is, isn't it important to recognize that there's a whole cultural component to the definition of tra- how people define trauma? It's, it's yes. context specific, right? Yes, and that has that has interested me. I mean, part of the the um, this new book on PTSD was emerged from my tracking how clinicians were using the PTSD diagnosis in different um, crisis zones and using it in a particular way that's very different from clinical practice. Like I. I rarely use that diagnosis myself, but it has enormous currency in institutional settings, mm-hmm. in the courts, in the VA. You're system. talking about the DSM PTSD definition? Yeah, the yeah. DSM um, category of PTSD. And it, it has a lot of currency. And then I began to wonder how it was being used in these institutional settings because every diagnosis is a, um, you know, it's a decision tree where you rule things out, rule mm-hmm. things in a differential diagnosis. So I, I think the, um, the, the use of, of this diagnosis in institutional settings, it was also, also came to be um, problematic, um, but also a way that clinicians were managing a dilemma that we face in these institutional settings it, where it's a diagnosis that is a redemptive one saying, you, your symptoms are not your fault. It's a social responsibility to address the sources of your suffering. And you are not carrying a deficit or deficiency um, or a form of degeneracy that would explain it. So it's very redemptive in that sense, but it also, has this cost attached to it mm-hmm. in terms of you have to have partly produce a, a trauma story that that meets certain criteria. And many of the experiences people had when I was in Afghanistan and then meetings at the VA and afterwards and following the, that story, you know, a lot of what veterans struggle with, even in war zones, is not a discrete event in a firefight. You know, it's a much more pervasive set of issues. And I, I hope that, that um, your viewers and listeners check out Mind Zone Therapists Behind the Front Lines in the context of now winding up this forever war in Afghanistan, because I was also trying to follow there the lessons of mental health practices in the context of warfare, mm-hmm. uh, particularly when the mission isn't at all clear. You're referencing uh, the documentary film you did, right? Yeah. Again, I'll have that linked up here at the show notes page. Jan, um, how do you, what definition do you use for trauma? How do you define trauma? I, I use a, a definition that um, depends on the context, how I use the term. And so I try to follow what's going on in the situation. I, I'm, I have a, a, I've been sensitized to how it's used, you know, the currency of the term. So I will usually start with something like suffering or something is distressing, overwhelming, more descriptive. When I listen to people, either in a documentary setting, field research, or my clinical practice, I don't introduce that term because I think it it conveys damage, enduring damage. And I think it's been part of the clinical, uh, the medicalizing or the pathologizing and suffer, 
of suffering and emotions attached to suffering in general. Like over the past year and a half with this horrific pandemic, there's been enormous suffering, not evenly distributed, of course, mm -hmm. but it's not for the most part trauma. And I- Because? Because I think with trauma, there is, there is enduring lasting damage that um, also is associated with how that concept gets enlisted in various settings that I think pulls away from the complexity of, um, of the dynamics of the situation. It also tends to rule out the conflicts that the individual experiences. Hmm. So, um, you you mean the inherent day to day conflicts that one experiences? I think even that even the conflict, like Freud, um, was of course in error in many points, but wrote some um, very insightful commentary and actually re re uh, provided testimony after World War One on shell shock and soldiers, and one important observation that I wor have worked with in much of my writing is that the, the, the symptoms of, of soldiers were not that he was so blasted by the impact always of a bomb that he was rendered mute. It was often the conflict with his own superiors mm. that led the soldier to be mute or fail to lift his arm because if you can't lift your arm, you can't pick up a gun to shoot. And so Freud um, argued, I think rightfully, that that trauma, which involves a kind of an internal external impact, like trauma therapy, trauma surgeons, trauma teams, they deal with a full impact of an event. So trauma model is an impact model. And what often then gets repressed by the trauma model is the struggle people have in the relational situation, not always with an evil monster overtaking them with a gun or, um, or some form of assault, but some other kind of dynamic that enlists them in, in a very destructive situation. So, you know, when I was following the PTSD stories in the military, it was actually forbidden to talk about your criticism of leadership in the military. You cannot talk about, while you're in active service, criticism of the command structure, or even the mission itself. So that comes up something in my film, you know, the, this, this whole issue, you can't talk about the mission. So, but you can talk about a blast in a firefight. And so that is, since I feel the trauma model often marginalizes the struggles of a more dynamic nature and the conflicts people have with the situations they're in, I try to create room for that because it, um, it does tend to get marginalized through much of the application of the trauma model. Yeah, really, really interesting. And I think uh, really interesting for the listeners out there who are therapists. It, what is your message to people who are listening to this, who are therapists, who are trauma therapists, who are working with people who've been impacted by trauma? Wh what are you saying to them? Well, you know, the old saying, if the only hammer you have, the whole world looks like a nail. Yeah. Well, I think there are, it's like being a psycho, I'm a psychoanalytic psychologist and there are very crude Freudians and it's easy to poke fun at them. I think there are crude trauma therapists who just see trauma everywhere and they don't see anything else. And I don't think they should be practicing because there are many, many people who suffer who are not traumatized in the clinical sense. So. I think having a more um, nuanced, <laughs> variegated way of looking at human suffering, to have a lower threshold for what registers clinically, um, you know, 
you know, anxiety and de the symptoms of anxiety and depression and the, um, in some ways overlap um, indistinguishably from PTSD. Mm -hmm. So why are we more promoting PTSD than depression or anxiety, kind of the everyday garden variety troubles that for much of my early career was what we focused on, including, you know, feminist therapists. Why are so many people, women depressed? And what about our ordinary, you know, the ordinary everyday experience is what we call the housewife syndrome, you know, when I was at early psychiatric nursing. And it's not trauma, it's, it's kind of the repression and the oppression of possibilities. And I think a lot of young people are worried about the world, about the crime, climate crisis. That doesn't mean they're traumatized. Mm -hmm. It means they're worried and they're upset. So I think we need to have a larger emotional vocabulary. And that's basically what we do as clinicians. We give people a broader vocabulary. It's kind of emotional education, what we do. And so if we only have a crude, limited vocabulary, we can't speak to the broad range of distressing experiences people have. And I think we impair them rather than equip them to deal with the, the problems of the world. And just remind everyone that I'm speaking with Jan Hocken, Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Portland State University. Um, uh, her film is called Mind Zone. It's a documentary. We'll have that linked up here at the show notes page at the traumatherapistpodcast.com. Her book, one of her books, Psychiatry, Politics, and PTSD, published by Routledge. Jan, what's the best way for people to uh, find out about you and what you're doing? Well, I have a, a website, jhaken.com, J-H-A-A-K-N.com. And, and many of my films, which are on related themes, troubled people in troubled places, um, are on the um, available. Um, they're, they're all available one way or another, different dr distribution avenues. Um, but And my books are listed there as well. Thank you for that question. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. It's it's fascinating to me. Um, I'm just looking on your website right now. Um, one of the films is called Necessity, Oil, Water, and Climate Resistance. Um, another one is called Our Bodies, Our Doctors. Jan, my God, you are doing it. And it may seem like a, a lot of random topics, but these are all... Um, all of my films focus on people carrying out different difficult work, often behind closed doors or tall fences in various, I did a film on the Oregon State Hospital here in Oregon where one flow of the cuckoo's nest is filmed. Wow. Why it was so hard to get in the hospital? Why it was so hard to get out? And I, and I really try to bring out the dilemmas of people, clinicians who are working in, in hard places. And Our Bodies, Our Doctors focuses on abortion doctors who've made this ethical commitment to being there for women in a difficult time. And that's another area that trauma has not been very useful. Overwhelming, the overwhelming majority of women of abortions have not been traumatized, have no symptoms of trauma. And it's interesting because the anti-abortion movement has made a great deal of um, linking abortion to trauma when actually um, giving birth is much more associated with clinical syndromes and, and clinical symptoms than abortion. So um, a lot of my, um, my documentaries also have been about looking at the, how people work in settings and clinical work in various ways. A number of them include medical settings, but also mental health settings. Do you have a, a, a team you work with or do you just pick up the camera and go? No. <laughs> I, ha I do have teams. I have, sometimes I'll pick up a camera, but for nothing that I expect to get, get distributed anywhere. No, I, I usually have a pretty um, mobile team. There are usually five of us, two camera operators, sound recordists, um, 
and an assistant. We were able to even film in um, during the pandemic using the rules by the, the state guidelines for filming during the pandemic because we're a small unit outside and mm -hmm. um and so we were we were able to carry out that that work but um i i think also the the way in which um particularly there's a lot of focus on um native leadership in the climate movement um and the experience of trauma that native people have suffered throughout the history of this country that is also emerging now in terms of leadership in the climate movement and how native people have preserved a sense of, of self, of uh, personal and collective integrity, um, the concepts of resilience have interested me where I know you can sometimes bounce from trauma to resilience in a way that 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 escapes too much from the trauma side of the equation. But I've learned a lot from Native activists over the last few years carrying out these projects and how people um, who suffered a great deal can also teach us a great deal as we move forward and try to find a path out of the climate crisis that is overtaking us. Interesting. What is, what is your, what are your thoughts on, you know, there are a lot of um, different trauma treatment modalities out there. When you were, becoming educated and, uh, you know, got really interested in, in trauma. What, what did you study? What did you find helpful in terms of treatment? I think some basic principles still apply in terms of careful listening. Um, there, there was a, um, there is a tendency among psychodynamic clinicians, and I am one of my psychodynamic clinicians, clinician, to focus too much on the, the disturbing traumatic event, what we call the bad objects, you know, in psychodynamic thinking, we're all inhabited by good objects and bad objects, and over we draw on them over time. And if the bad representations of destructive people in the past predominate in the inner world over the sustaining um, representations of people and care, then we're haunted by, um, and sometimes perpetuate our own misery because we're ruled by these kind of what native people call the bad spirits, the malevolent spirits. And I, I think there is a tendency among trauma therapists to focus too much on quote, the bad objects, the destructive. And so I have found it over the course of my career, a consistent principle is to also be interested in what sustained people. So I've seen many people who were abused as children. And then I'm interested in, you know, when you went to that neighbor for help ran next door, what was that like for you? And you hear her voice there, you know, because sometimes I think a misconception of early students when I was training students as therapists was, well, the real work is to go after the bad, you know, because that's what's been denied, minimized, or repressed. But the good also gets repressed. People who might have loved you, who also were bad for you. Um, I have... I remember one patient of mine who had a clearly a, a mother who was manic depressive and flagrantly psychotic in a manic phases and a chaotic childhood. But this patient had a wonderful sense of humor and a kind of liveliness and often was late for sessions, but had a damn good story to tell when she got there, you know. And we started talking about her liveliness being a bit of her mother's mania and how exciting her mother could be. Um, 
and yet how how horrifying it was when she went over the top you know and i i think that if there's one uh, one principle i i hope my students would hold on to is just don't be too seduced by the dark side because uh, it's it's kind of attractive in this reverse logic way because we're used to thinking of the dark side as what we need to attend to mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to escape that but it's also important for people to be able to gather up the good objects you know they right. wh whoever you see has managed to live in the world before they got to you right I also, form think, of care. I also think i'm curious what you think too as as a clinician there's this um joy of investigation of discovering that's it i see it that's where it is now i can apply what i've learned you know with all the workshops i've gone to all the books i read do to do, do we can i can do the work now because what you're talking about here um you, you know the person has begun their healing process long before they walked into your office there's something very well oh yeah okay there's something very almost simplistic about that um i think we would call it the beauty of parsimony yeah um but uh yeah i think what you're saying is so important and look i mean we could i could go on here forever because i think i'm gonna have to have you back jan and i'd love to maybe to talk about what we had planned on talking about <laughs> which was the the moral the injury moral injury we're gonna have to do another episode if you'd like if you'd be willing to come back I would love that because okay. um, it, one of the almost predictable responses in, of audiences of clinicians when I've shown Mind Zone for years, it was shown, and I, I still show it occasionally, which I welcome um, to clinical audiences, is that the corrective to the limits of PTSD is this concept of moral injury. And I, I think it's, there are some problems with how, how that, I don't see it as a real corrective to the problems of PTSD, but we, maybe we can take that up a different, a different time. I'd love to talk about it because a lot of clinicians I know have kind of embraced that concept and for good reasons, you know, recognizing kind of the physiological focus of PTSD, often the narrowness of it. Okay, definitely we'll do that. Uh, let's close out here. And um, again, you know, we'll have your books up and films up on the, on the show notes here at the trauma therapist podcast.com. But share with our listeners as we close out a go to book recommendation, something that's inspired you, uh, whether trauma related or not, or whatever. Well, I would often assign literature in my psychopathology class, which I routinely taught and um, often would focus on child childhood abuse and the and the lessons of the uh, trauma movement and um, the works I found particularly profound were uh, the novels of Toni Morrison and so one book that I would work with in the class as one of the most important books you could read about trauma was the bluest eye mm, okay and it it has a part of what's so important about it is how many how many of the people in this tragic girl <clears throat> tragically traumatized girl's life are kind of implicated not equally but sharing in some way in the suffering of this girl and it's a it's a powerful book and I think clinicians often would benefit from reading more literature <laughs> than clinical texts on trauma. There's, and, and a, particularly um, women authors, people of color have, have produced a rich, rich um, tradition of literary works on trauma. Awesome, the bluest eye, Toni Morrison. Before we go, look, you, you're you're amazing i mean you're so inspiring really all the work you're doing what you're definitely on a mission what's your what's your mission i i grew up in a missionary family where we were all called to the mission field so i was i sort of pulled back 
pull back at that. Plus there was all that talk about the mission in the military and no one knew what the hell the mission was. <laughs> so those are my first two associate free associations with that but i'm i'm a teacher at heart so even as a clinician documentary filmmaker i i'm in my mission is to take complicated social questions of psychological concern that tend to be oversimplified or bifurcated in the, you know good bad simple categories to bring a more complex way of understanding um social problems that help us to think and be engaged in dialogue in a in a more productive way in um in addressing the the problems we are facing around the history of racism the history of socially produced suffering the climate crisis the climate crisis is my current mission mm -hmm. for and i'm i've started writing a, a book on on what I've learned interviewing over 200 activists over the last three years on that crisis mm -hmm. and, and what psychology can bring to it. And so that's always an interest. What, it, what can we with humility and not overstating what we know, what we can bring as psychologists and therapists to understanding of social problems as just one part of a conversation. Awesome, Jen. Awesome having you on here. Thank you so much. It was an honor. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been great talking with you. All right. Take care. You too.